Our panel here today on the special interest group for values-based and sustainable innovation. So uh, thank you all for participating in that. Uh, we had a whole track of activities already starting from this morning and uh, one of the issues or observations uh, we started with was the observation that this current crisis, which is also topical for uh, this conference, um, brings values to the forefront of attention, namely values of uh, health and caring for the most vulnerable, and also shows how these can rapidly uh, impact and lead to a cultural change and also drive innovation from very sm small scale yeah, to uh, of cartoons populating football stadiums to uh, big uh, behavioral changes in the society. But on, also we see that this is obviously not enough and will not uh, suffice to uh, tackle the great societal challenges that we're facing with respect to climate change, biodiversity, um, and uh, related issues. So uh, today we wanna follow up on this discussion. We see, so there's a lot of goodwill even in the organizations and the business world in many domains that we're working in. But the question is how do we come from this goodwill that uh, has been declared on different management levels up to the Green Deal we will go briefly go into uh, of the European Union how can we make sure this kind of goodwill is uh, being translated into uh, good practice? And Florian, if you show us our first slide with the participants. Um, so I'm very happy to discuss these and related issues today with our thought leaders, Corey Wyron from Ecosia, Roman Meyer Andre, Divisional Head of Corporate IT and Digitalization at TÜV Nord Mobility, Sven Uwe Müller, the program leader of uh, with GZ and head of the lab of tomorrow. Matthias Rauterberg, a professor of designing interactive systems at Eindhoven University of Technology. And um, maybe later on, Stefan Schaltegger, professor of uh, sustainability management at Leuphana University Lüneburg. Florian Lüdecke Freund and myself will moderate the session. And yeah, if you allow, I would just jump right into the discussion on the next slide and um, maybe we can take turns and uh, uh, Corey could start in addressing the first question, which would be, what is your approach to uh, values and managing values and sustainability in your organization, which is Ecosia? And maybe you can uh, initially also introduce yourself and Ecosia in two or three sentences again. Sure, uh, thanks. So my name is Corey Wyron. I'm a senior product manager uh, at Ecosia. Um, I've only been with the company for a couple months. My background is actually in politics. Uh, I was chief of staff for a county commissioner back in the United States uh, before moving to Germany. Um, and more about Ecosia, which I think is more interesting than my biography, but uh, Ecosia is an alternative search engine. And what they're doing is using ad revenue to plant trees. Um, and we know that climate change is a massive problem. We all need to do something. Uh, and this makes it easy for users to just can do it, continue doing the things that they always do, just searching the web. Um, but by doing that action, they're helping to combat climate change uh, one search at a time. Uh, and we use that money to plant trees. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, a little bit about the organization, and then the approach to values and sustainability uh, in the company. So because sustainability is such a very crucial part of who Ecosia is as a company, uh, what our responsibility is to our users and to our employees, uh, these questions about what employees do in their personal life appear as early as uh, like the initial interview. So Ecosia doesn't hire people unless they support the mission and can show that they are active in their own lives. Um, so they bring these values then to the organization. Uh, and then we see this continue uh, with the company values. Um, we see this continue in ways where employees are encouraged to make good choices by incentivizing, um, you know, supporting uh, folks who are using uh, sustainable 
energy choices um, where, uh, yeah, the company provides a subsidy. Uh, so we see this all across the organization from the minute that you have a chat with the recruiter to, you know, when you're in the door and as an employee. Um, and right now, I think that when we look at the global crisis of, uh, you know, COVID, when we look at what's happening in the U.S. and across the world regarding Black Lives Matter, there have been some really interesting conversations within our organization around values and how we use those values to create products. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. Okay, great. I think we can get back to some of these issues later on. So the internal direction, engaging the employees, especially in really complying with these values, not only within the organization, but all across their lives, basically. And uh, also the outside activities where you're compensating the energy used for search queries in order to uh, yeah, fulfill an ecological mission, so to say. Very interesting. Okay. Um, Roman, Maya, Andre, do you want to add on what's your approach to values and issues of sustainability and innovation management at TÜV Nord Mobility? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, obviously, we as a company are also focused on, on values in itself, security and safety, of course, um, which are at the, at the heart of what we've been doing. So protecting lives, basically, that's where we're coming from. And I guess moving forward, Protecting lives means also uh, more than just a very um, concrete um, way of protecting life through security and safety, but also through uh, sustainable development. So we are pretty much expanding our focus also within the realm of the SDGs and uh, the sustainability goals um, and, and uh, looking a lot into these things as also our customers, as you might say, uh, the industries we're working for are also um, identifying these as very important parts of their daily doing. And now customers and customers are really looking for proof points that these promises are really kept. And we as a neutral third party are obviously um, highly interested in defining standards and, and then also offering our services to helping um, achieving these standards and living up to these standards. So I think that's kind of the external view and also adding pretty much to the internal perspective here. I think customer centricity is probably when you come from a third party controlling party yeah, and really focusing on customer values is kind of still a way and we, we are really starting to understand much better the benefits and needs we really want to drive to the market through uh, ethnographical studies and so on. So that's also what, what we try to rethink our way in doing, not being the controller and the, 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 um, just the tester and controller, but also being a partner to our customers, really understanding how we can help them achieve their best by staying neutral and independent. Mm -hmm. All right, very interesting. So on the one hand, this kind of strategic shift from focusing on values of safety and security uh, towards an integration of sustainability related values as part of the business and the whole business ecosystem of TÜV Nord. And on the other hand, like facilitation and really trying to understand not only immediate customer interests, but long-term values also to uh, improve operations and business, right, on a uh, daily level. Great. So um, if I may move on to uh, Sven-Uwe Müller. So we had your very nice presentation already in the morning about the lab of tomorrow. Unfortunately, I really have to say, uh, not everybody participating here now uh, had the chance to look into uh, this presentation, please take the chance and uh, have a look in the video once it's up there. But can you briefly sum up what's your approach to values-based framing and uh, sustainable development uh, with the Lab of Tomorrow? Yes, sure, thank you. Yeah, the Lab of Tomorrow, when we started five years ago, um, we kind of were commissioned by BMZ, by the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, to promote the SDGs. So the sustainability is really at the very core of our mission. 
the lab of tomorrow is a small project team within GIZ, uh, which uh, elaborated a process, an innovation process, to develop uh, sustainable business models for the promotion of uh, SDG relevant um, uh, uh, tasks to address uh, SDG relevant challenges. And um, so um, we, I think we can say that, that uh, sustainability is really at the very core of our mission. And, um, but uh, of course, I, I think sustainability is a, is a kind of fuzzy term and we always have to pay attention to not lose track because there is no absolute sustainability. There's always, there are always trade-offs and we have these three pillars of sustainability, uh, economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, social sustainability. And um, depending on the on the um, context in which you are acting, you have to to do different trade-offs. So um, I think it's not as easy as it seems, <laughs> but um, uh, at least with this very clear target on the SDGs, uh, our mission is quite clear. And uh, until now, I would say just by involving the right stakeholders and bringing them together in an in an open um, innovation process um, to generate sustainable business models, we were uh, successful in, in really um, generating business ideas which um, uh, can and uh, uh, hopefully will even more contribute in the future to achieving the, the um, SDGs. Just to give one example, because otherwise it sounds a bit, a bit uh, uh, abstract, um, for example, um, uh, when we had uh, a lab on improving access to medication in Kenya, one of the ventures which developed from this um, open innovation process um, is called Maisha Meds, and it's, it's um, now a full-fledged company um, uh, doing business and it um, kind of provided a whole infrastructure uh, at the point of sale, uh, uh, point of service for all these uh, different little pharmacies and um, also the, the uh, local uh, small hospitals so that they can procure medicine in a more efficient and a cheaper way and can provide this um, to the patients in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> that's, that's a very nice and impressive example and it shows very nicely I think as well how uh, such a values based or in that case even a normative framing also uh, serves as a heuristic to develop new business models and uh, as a reference to um, manage the impact that these business models then are supposed to have uh, once they're up and running. Um, Matthias, may I lead over to you? Uh, we also heard a very impressive presentation on uh, this type term, term, not so much innovation management, but rather in design and design management uh, and found out about a really impressive tool that now everyone's trying to uh, experiment with. Um, so what's your take on, uh, yeah, values and sustainability in the realm of design? Um, yeah, I, I, I have two prime functions as a, a professor at my university. One of them is research, which I presented uh, in the uh, morning session. And uh, here I would like to uh, um, <coughs> discuss uh, our approach to teaching. Uh, mm -hmm. The main yeah, delivery of universities are uh, teaching students uh, and uh, educating them. And uh, what we did uh, from an innovation point of view, uh, the whole university and I was uh, involved in this process was setting up the Department of Industrial Design because in the Netherlands we have three technical universities. So the biggest one is a, a technical university in Delft. Um, the second one is Eindhoven and the third one is in Twente. Um, from a historical point of view when they were established uh, and uh, <coughs> the industrial design program as an innovation driver in the Netherlands in Delft is uh, classical, 
product design from any type of product and Eindhoven uh, was uh, more focused on interact interactive product, also from uh, apps on smartphones up to uh, intelligent environments uh, like uh, smart homes or whatever. Um, so we have to teach our students uh, electronics, programming, to master not only the material as from a classical point of view, but also uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> skills and knowledge they need to make the uh, products uh, intelligent or smart or uh, interactive at least. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> and uh, what we did, and that was a unique opportunity uh, when we launched the department 20 years ago, uh, we got carte blanche for the educational program. So we uh, hired an education director from mechanical engineering. He experimented with competency-based learning uh, and he had to run his uh, program on a hybrid space, classical uh, frontal lecturing and uh, uh, competency-based or project-based learning. Uh, and here in our department, he got the uh, chance to establish a clean competency, self-directed and uh, uh, competency-centered learning program, which was uh, for 10 years, uh, we were trying to make sense out of it. Uh, and uh, the, main, the main idea is uh, to set the hierarchy, the, 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 the authority who de determines what to learn and how to learn uh, upside down. Also, normally I was supposed as a full professor to uh, develop a curriculum with my colleagues together and then expose it to our students and teaching them. And if they are <clears throat> willing to follow our education program, then they can learn something we think they must achieve. Uh, the competency-based and self-directedness of our program 20 years ago was uh, the students was entitled and enforced to set up their own uh, personal development plan at the beginning of the semester. We offered certain learning activities, experiences. They can select uh, uh, whatever they want to learn to achieve their own uh, development goals. And we assess them at the end of the semester whether they achieve their own goals or not. So uh, partially of the uh, program was uh, they had to choose projects. And then they came to me because we have a project market where all the teachers like me are offering our projects to the student and the students are challenging me, Matthias, tell me what can I learn when I take your project? And then I was, <laughs> then I was challenged in a totally different way as I was used to in the past uh, before that. Uh, it turns out that this uh, kind of self-directed learning, you don't create a fixed curriculum for all students, uh, but uh, uh, each student develops on, on the way through the bachelor and master program, their own curriculum. So at the end of the, uh, um, uh, final bachelor uh, graduation, um, you had as many uh, uh, curricula or learning paths through the learning space we offered as students on board. Um, some of them are more similar based on their own interests and motivation, and some of uh, them are obviously diverse. That was not the problem. The problem was uh, we have an accreditation in the Netherlands, and I guess in Germany and other countries as well, where on the five or six year pace, yeah, uh, the whole program has to be accredited by external reviewers uh, to get the license to continue. And uh, this was always a nightmare to convince them that we are doing fine because we cannot guarantee, based on this kind of self-directedness, that the students um, all together achieve the same kind of expertise. But each of the students, I can, I can guarantee, I can give you, they are out, they are excelling and outperform because they are highly motivated. Okay, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the good part of the story. Uh, when I was uh, for two years uh, program director of the education program, I said, look, what are competencies? And competencies are, in our case, defined as a com combination of attitudes, skills, and knowledge. Frontal teaching, as I was used to in the past, is uh, knowledge centered. And the practical uh, programs like uh, engineering programs or design programs are adding a certain amount of skills through practicing and doing something. Uh, and nobody was taking care about the attitudes. And the attitudes are something very personal because then you have to talk about values and norms and all the things that people care about their life. 
And uh, what, what I found very interesting and intriguing was that most of the students uh, are really, as a design students, are really motivated to shape the world to a better one. That was the prime motivation for, I would say, almost all of our students till today. Mm. And that is uh, when, yeah, <clears throat> unfortunately, I have to admit that uh, university was not so uh, fond of our experimental uh, educational program and they put a lot of pressure on the, uh, on the department to get aligned with the other educational programs at the rest of the university. Uh, and now we have a hybrid uh, situation, which is more confusing. I'm not allowed officially to say so, but uh, as a teacher involved in that, uh, it's more confusing to everybody than uh, the old one or the, uh, the traditional one. Clear uh, case where the power is in the hand of the teachers, the students have to, yeah, uh, to follow you. Uh, or the self-directedness where the student is in charge. Uh, but now we have something, a mix, a very strange mix, where it's still unclear when, who is when in charge of what. Okay, that, mm -hmm. that's uh, my experience so far. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, an interesting case also on uh, yeah, how to mobilize individual resources and aspirations to uh, contribute to a better world if you just uh deviate from the traditional teaching paradigm so to say right uh, Henning, look if you go back to all the most of the presentations yeah? customer centered user centered participatory it's nothing less than trying to give the customer or the, the stakeholders and certain type of stakeholders a voice mm -hmm. just bring them into the yeah? give them an opportunity to uh, uh, co design will take decisions or even express uh, at least uh, their own opinion about something. All right, great. Um, yeah, so then I'm uh, very happy to uh, welcome also Stefan Schaltegger uh, in our little round of discussionists here. He's a professor for sustainability management at Leuphana University, as I in the introductory round and Stefan maybe you briefly present yourself to those participants that do not know you yet and uh, that you explain us what how you work with <clears throat> values and obviously sustainability um, in at Leuphana University. Hello together <clears throat> thank you and sorry that I had some technical problems I, I was um, in the audience but uh, not on the platform <laughs> before um, yeah, I'm professor uh, of uh, sustainability management, uh, leading the Center for Sustainability Management at Leuphana University Lüneburg, and we developed the MBA program in sustainability management in 2003 um, and um, have run that program since then. But we also have uh, students on the bachelor and on the uh, first level master, um, uh, well, levels and, and programs. Um, well, I think normative issues play an absolutely crucial role for sustainable development and uh, therefore also values. First of all, because the goal uh, of sustainable development in general is a normative goal. Uh, it says we care about the future and you could also not care about the future. So already there, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, clearly a value-based uh, issue. And uh, I think this has been acknowledged uh, also uh, in, for instance, 1992 in the UN Rio agenda that participation is part of sustainable development. Uh, that means that that's also uh, a value that other stakeholders, that many groups should be involved. Um, I mean, if you just take survival of mankind or humankind of human beings, the survival on the planet, as a goal, then you would not have to involve everybody necessarily. Um, uh, and then you, you could also have different values or opinions. And um, I think these statements already show that the goal as such um, is, is very um, value-based. Um, then what it entails is value-based. Um, for instance, if you look at the UN SDGs, which are widely acknowledged, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, it's very difficult to find animal welfare in there. However, a lot of people, at least in Germany, would say animal welfare has something to do with sustainability. So you have uh, values there about 
what does sustainable development entail? And then I think at the next step, you also have values which play a key role. How should the end state or the, the goal look like if you take a scenario? Uh, how does a sustainable society uh, look like? Some say, well, degrowth and sufficiency, that would be the ideal state. And of course, a society where everybody lives and consumes and produces in, in a sufficient manner, um, we have no growth at all, looks completely different, for instance, to a cradle-to-cradle -cradle, um, driven, designed, sustainable society where, uh, for instance, Michael Braungard, as the promoter of uh, Cradle to Cradle, would say, well, if everybody, everything is in um, uh, perfect uh, circles, we have a perfect circle economy, or is biodegradable, then we can waste, because that will be nutrition for, you know, other plants and animals, etc. And, of course, such a wasteful society as a sketch or scenario of sustainability is completely different to a sufficiency oriented one. And then fourth, I think that the rationales how to achieve a sustainable development um, are value based um, because that's the question, what methods, what approaches are logical and can be logically deducted from the, the goals we have. Um, uh, and there, I think we uh, have to discuss that. That's something we do in, in our MBA program, for instance. We discuss the, the general normative aspects and, and value uh, or, or the, the, the importance of values for the general goal, for what it could mean with different scenarios, what it entails, uh, and how it could be achieved. And there is not just one way, one path, but they're very different views and they're also competing with each other. Um, we can see that in research, we can see that in the society. And I think that is also very nice because this competition of different views and approaches uh, is also a basis for innovation. And personally, I think there's not one way, but it has to be a mix of different ways. And it is good uh, to, to interact, to have bring together these different perspectives and having a plurality of values is also part of uh, sustainable development. Great, so Florian, do you want to continue? Yes, sure. Um, so thanks a lot for this um, very interesting uh, first round um, so 30 minutes uh, out of the 40 we're having are already over uh, so and I think we already heard and learned a lot so what I would like to do is to to offer you the opportunity to um, comment some more on your own experience and um, there's a second question we prepared uh, which could serve as a follow-up to what you just introduced so we were all kind of you know, providing your perspective and explaining how you make this connection between what you do in your core business uh, in relation and how you're related to values and issues of sustainability. Um, and Matthias Rauterberg was already pointing to some institutional challenges, but, but here's the general question in, in your work and connecting what, you, what you're doing, what you're doing in your core business, what are major challenges to make this connection to values and sustainability? And at, at the same time, what kind of solutions did you find um, to, to overcome these challenges. And um, I, I like to start with this, Corey, again, um, uh, if you would like to provide a statement on this. Thanks, Florian. Um, yeah, I think that right now there's a, a really important question to be asked about what sustainability means and what that means for people in different circumstances across the globe. Because at Ecosia, we are trying to make the world a more compassionate place for everyone. Um, but when you truly try to make something better for everyone, that leads to different company strategy, different um, product direction. I mean, for instance, there are you know plenty of people across the internet, the, across the world that don't have internet access. So 
us as an alternative, you know, search engine, what are we doing to improve, you know, the situation for people who don't have access to the internet? Um, so how we're addressing that challenge internally, there's a lot of open conversations about what is uh, our strategy. Uh, we're involving employees from the beginning um, and asking what they think the direction for Ecosia should be. Um, and I think that that, you know, it's not it's not going to solve everything, but then employees feel like they have buy-in. Um, and I think our solutions are stronger because it's done collectively. Um, so I think just trying to be inclusive when developing strategy helps overcome some of those challenges. Yeah, and you were, you were referring to employees and there was a question from, from the audience. How do, you, how do you make sure that there's kind of a fit between your, your organizational values and an employee's? Hey, I saw that. Thank you so much, Marian. I'll try to be quick because I'm sure that others would like to speak as well. But I think it's finding touch points across the lifespan of the relationship between the company and employee. You know, it's from conversations that are happening during hiring and onboarding to set the tone and expectations. Um, definitely building relationships that are founded in trust. Um, and then at Ecosia, for instance, you know, we're incentivizing um, through various means and providing opportunities for education and whether that's uh, regarding regenerative agriculture, whether that's bike repair workshops, so that it, we make it easier for employees to find alternative methods of coming to work. Um, and then looking just, you know, long term at six months at Ecosia, um, if you pass probation, <laughs> then you get the opportunity to go to one of the 9,000 planting sites we have across the globe, really connecting employees to the mission. And so I think it's just consistently and constantly looking for those touch points with employees to keep bringing them back to what the mission is. Um, whether that's the vegan brunch we have on Wednesday, whether that's the trip to the planting sites, um, or just regular updates about what the work we do has on impact. Okay, so making people plant trees is a kind of a test. Uh, so that's great. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Roman, you explained how you're making this connection between a more external and internal view. So, so what kind of challenges um, do, do you see uh, or do you perceive in making this connection, bringing sustainability considerations also to your products and services? Yeah, I, I like the, the idea from, from Stefan Schalteger a lot because I, I do think when, when there's several ways that lead, probably the, where you could think, you know, you can achieve certain, certain uh, goals, uh, SDGs and so on, whatever have you. Um, even safety security. I mean, one, one great example is we're coming from functional safety, moving more to IT security. So functional safety, I can tell you, uh, or, um, not me, but my colleagues definitely can tell you if your car is probably going to be safe for the next two years or not, all things considered. Um, but we can never tell you that your software, the software of the car is kind of uh, safe, uh, intrusion safe. It's, it's a constant, you know, it's heuristics. So I think we're much more moving into that sort of world where, where we're talking more of, um, um, we, we cannot tell you at one moment and point, is that uh, the right, is, is this thing now safe? Is that sustainable? Is that whatever goal you want to achieve? But we could do the, the best to our knowledge and we can bring in uh, expert knowledge into that, that, that we can say, yeah, most probably, with a high uh, chance this leads you to the same direction while we don't decide on the way you want to go right? we wouldn't tell you you have to go in a sufficiency way or into a circular economy way we wouldn't decide on that but we would give a neutral idea around yeah probably with with how you are going to approach that you will you will land on the on the right spot you will achieve your goal with that and this adds of course a whole new level of um uncertainty also to our business, right? And the whole new level of, of having to think about, I'm thinking AI uh, in, in, in algorithms and automated driving, right? And then ethics come in and things like that, where, where we have to deal with today. And the automotive OEMs come to us in a much earlier stage now, um, not, not, not when their product is ready, but they come to us really early and tell us, um, yeah, we don't even know how we can get this approved and there's probably not even uh, legislation yet in place to get this thing here approved, but please tell us, you know, what shall we do? What, what is probably the right path we want to go? So we're much more talking about the, the, the paths we want to walk on 
and then try to to give a neutral unbiased perspective if that's if that's a thing <laughs> if that's even possible you know but give a um, um, as as unbiased as possible way um, and not judging on the way that that it goes right and this also is kind of the challenge every day in the internal right because obviously as a 150 year old company you have a lot of um, diversity uh, within the company uh, um, and 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 uh, I, I I think it's it's unfair you know to to kind of move about with with oh hey i have the solution it's kind of with the students right uh, i'm i'm also asking my team more you know okay what what do you think how we should move about that right uh, what 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 would your approach be so then let's test it out and maybe um we'll find something if not you know we need to iterate so i think that's this agility that's getting into all these um processes that we see that makes life much more complicated but also also um, at the same time um, much more interesting probably thanks a lot uh, so maybe this wish for agility and flexibility is something that matthias rauterberg uh kind of i think can connect to because in, in as i got it from your explanation of the challenges in the university context there was maybe not sufficient willingness to be flexible in terms of how to set up a curriculum for example so, so can you can you connect to this challenge that Roman my Andre just uh, um, no, yeah not directly but uh, I have a comment for Roman yeah for example a uh, couple of years ago yeah I was asked by an advisory committee for the Dutch government yeah, what uh, I should recommend as an expert to improve the uh, economic situation in the Netherlands. And I said, please, please, one thing only, make the software developer as responsible for their product as any other sector, car or whatever. Yeah? And then they said, oh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, we will take it home. And then <laughs> never heard anything back from that because the software sector is the only one which said, whatever you get from us, we don't take any responsibility. We don't take any responsibility. And this is a major threat to improve the quality of software products. That, that, that's the bottom line, because uh, the uh, university education program would change dramatically if software would have the same liability uh, 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 so legally yeah, uh, obliged uh, to deliver than any other sector I'm familiar with. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, is uh, something which I think has a major impact on our future life as well. I can't imagine the future where this will continue. It's, it's insane to do so from a political level, but also from an economical and educational level. It has a strong impact. I, we know how to do safer uh, software, to develop safer software, let's phrase it like that. But we don't do that. Some, yeah. some tendencies there where it gets better because like I, 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 we, we just, um, uh, approved the new Corona app for Germany as, as, as TÜV Nord and, and I, I, I know that this discussion has been at the very beginning of this app. The first discussion was not around what the software can do but what was around how would the architecture be and it was a I, I would say an almost an expert discussion on where is data stored and I saw it in the German Tagesschau right this this very you know, uh, typically very nerdy discussion around where is the data stored and yeah. things. So I saw that at the yeah. very beginning of this app development and I, I, I felt it is a good thing that, that we are starting from, you know, first discussing, mm. hey, how, how is that even constructed? Do we even want this construct or do we want to go a different approach, right? And this changed even the approach as far as I am part of this discussion. And as far as I understood, it changed the way uh, the German government decided for a different architecture of the app. So I, I feel there's a lot happening right now. What I fully understand, and that is a blind spot for quite a lot of uh, research I'm familiar with, is uh, uh, power. We hardly anybody really yeah, investigate and try to deal and try to understand what the nature of power is as an organizational structure, not power in the technical term, electricity, I mean power in organizational political yeah, terms. And uh, uh, the answer to, to your question, yeah, which I didn't answer because we had to side discussion about uh, liability is uh, 
I was struggling all the day long, you know, from first day when I became student to full professor at my university with the power structure and the way people have power and how they deal with that, the integrity of the personal integrity of pe people that have power. Because uh, the, the selection and promotion process is mainly, mainly uh, intransparent, also quite often. Eh? There is some official, uh, 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 I have been in a lot of appointment committees uh, where I had a very different, sometimes I, I said, no way, I step out. If you do these kind of uh, deals behind this official version, then I have to, to say, go, go ahead, but without me. And that was not very much appreciated by my colleagues. They said, ah, oh, Matthias, you are one of us, so please uh, behave like us. I said, I, I don't like this in lack of integrity here. But this is uh, one of the major, major uh, hurdle I had to face uh, because you can't talk about. It. How can you talk to the person which has power above you or uh, about you about his lack of integrity? It's for me, I have no clue how to do that. And I'm, I would love to, uh, to get that. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm getting older, that helps a lot. But <laughs> Uh, but uh, d during building up my career, I, w I was uh, uh, quite often in, in very de delicate situations. Mm. And this is right. my, my, yeah, okay, my, my five cent here to the answer. Yeah. yeah, I'm very, very sorry because as you all probably feel, we are just at starting uh, with the discussion. And uh, unfortunately, we just got a pretty short time slot here and already have to end it. So I would like to give Sven and uh, Stefan the chance to add a final comment if something comes up to your mind before the uh, ISPIM organizing team will start chasing us and moving us out of the room. I didn't get a message yet, but uh, I know from another session um, that yeah, things can move fast here if you're, <laughs> uh, if you're not fast yourself. So anything, okay. sorry very much everyone for having to make it that short now, but uh, Sven or Stefan, anything, any final comments you uh, can add? Very briefly, uh, as we talked about uh, making the connection between um, the values and the innovation process, I think making the connection is the one task, but keeping this connection is the other task. And that's, that also relates a bit to what, what you addressed, Matthias, uh, uh, with uh, integrity in, in a way, um, yeah, being connected to these values is a task which which uh, will accompany you over the whole process of your business and you always have to revisit your values. And um, that's what we also experience in our process. We really have, to, we never uh, are allowed to lose track of the values in, in this way. We always have to kind of re uh, revisit the values and, and look whether our business model, our, our um, organizational arrangements do still fit the purpose and do still promote the values. Yeah, I mean, this is really the impressive thing about the Lab of Tomorrow, this continuous impact assessment, right? So I pasted again the link here, or I will paste the link into the chat so you can go deeper in that project. Stefan, Please visit us and if you. you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm uh, also on LinkedIn. Yeah. Stefan, final word for you. If I would you may. like to add um, a, a different aspect, which is what is the job of academia and of science? And I think historically, um, and that's also uh, quite an agreement in society, we think that the job of scientists and of academia is to provide answers, clear answers, to provide certainty, to create certainty. However, in the context of sustainability, we have such complex, uh, dynamic, vexed problems that certainty cannot be created. And understanding this, and therefore to understand that the role of research and academia and uh, teaching is a completely different one, I think is a first starting point. And the job we have today, I think, is how to deal with uncertainty. And this is a completely different job and approach than what is usually assumed. And what we do, and a term which is often used in sustainability science, 
um, in this context is we try to develop these transdisciplinary approaches where you involve different uh, dis people from different disciplines and also practitioners in order to develop not object objectivity which cannot be developed and you won't find objective answers but which allows us to get a consensus on what we think is the problem a consensus or a range of agreement an area of agreement where we think this could lead to the right results this could be a good analysis and these could be solutions and then we experiment together and that also means that we have to be much more um, at ease also when these experiments do not work. And do not say, well, see, sustainability doesn't work, because that's a, an answer you very often get in business, very, very often get in, in society, uh, because we try out something and then we realize it doesn't work or doesn't work as effectively as we want it to. And then they say, oh, see, sustainability doesn't work. But that we understand that this is part of the process of finding solutions which eventually and hopefully will improve the situation in the world. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time, all the panelists, for uh, participating.